Hello, and welcome to the Long Patrol for Alive, which was pretty darn interesting. And honestly, along with, well, the consumption of slightly more iron brew than I was supposed to this week, have really made my week a lot better than it would have been. And I speak to you as someone who's still got his legs, well, his ankles firmly wrapped up. Now, the question from Michael66 was... And please note, the screen with the slides on is there. The question from Michael66 was, If Sing Tao incident leads to war, how does the 1939 RN carry force fare against 1939 IJN force? Now this, combined with the joyous thing that is occasionally the patron... Well, patron is very good, but they do have a limitation on how long you can put... In, how long you can put make... A question in Patreon. Got it shortened down to If January 1939, Sting Tao leads to war, how does Royal Navy carry a force fare against the Imperial Japanese Navy? And please note that's the important point of this question because it's January 1939. We're talking about the beginning of 1939. We're not talking about 1940, we're not talking 1941, so this affects what forces you're dealing with. And I'm going to explain this more as I go through. But it also expect, it affects the personalities and the people you're dealing with and the scenarios. Now, there are some very interesting comments which come out about this. But I am going to ask at the beginning of this video. There is going to be a desire to comment before the video is over. I don't mind. However... You might want to wait to the end, because I might cover your point, and this happens a lot on these what-if ones, slightly further on. And I say this mainly because I end up with a comment edit blizzard stream. And it can literally lead to my phone. I've only just figured out how to turn the notifications or comments off on my phone, going beep, beep, beep. Because as you edit the comment, because what you first wrote wasn't quite uh, was is then covered, but you now have another question, and edit it again and edit it again. I get a beep and a beep it again. Now, I found out the reason for this, and I think I've turned it off. But I'm just saying, just to save me on the beeps, please comment. But maybe wait till you're further on through the um, <laughs> video. <sighs> and again, I'm going to clarify, it's. January 1939. I'm going to set the scene. I'm going to give you the idea of what's going on. But some of the things you're used to hearing about in terms of the Japanese way of war and the Japanese warships and Japanese equipment and capabilities that are standard practice for World War II are physically not in existence in January 1939. It gets worse if you go back even further. Now, I am, of course, doing a shameless book plug because, well, whilst I have to admit the support of people who watch the videos and see the adverts and or are Prime users, so don't see the adverts, but I still get my, uh, still get some support from YouTube and the people who do super chats, super thanks, and the people who subscribe to the channel, the people who are patrons, all that really does help. I'm currently trying to buy a new car, or a new to me car, it won't be a... And um, if you know anything about the UK second-hand car market, I'm fairly certain the same has happened in lots of other countries around the world. Cars have kind of gone... <whistles> so that the car level I normally buy at, and which I got money for when my car was written off, due to mechanical failure. Thank you very much, insurance. Um, that was re representative of what I spent on the previous car, but n unfortunately, it's now about half of what you need for an equivalent car at the current times. <sighs> Which is annoying, because I do need a reliable car for travelling around the country and going to archives, etc. Because, believe it or not, 
Train fares and even plane tickets are quite expensive when you want to move books around with you. Disturbingly so. So, 1939 January. Now, I'm going to start off with some general facts, and then I'm going to get into some specific facts. It is the 30th of January 1939. Everything is historically as was up to this point. Japan didn't sign the Tripartite Pact till the 27th of September 1940. So, Germany and Italy and Japan are not allies. They might be friends, or rather Germany and... It, uh, Germany and Japan might be friends, but Italy and Japan are not. They still have a very interesting relationship. And honestly, the level of friendship of Germany and Japan is not as great as it will become. It goes greater during World War II, during the war actually starting. And it's a marriage of convenience. In many ways... It's the whole scenario of what happens in America and the various the Export Control Act, which drives Japan into the arms of the Axis forces and which creates a marriage of convenience. They are not a marriage of ideology. They are not a marriage of fret of love. They are a marriage of convenience. So that's the most important thing you need to understand because there are a number of people who were already on comments on the previous video, on the live and the discussion, right, going, well, you know, Germany and Italy will come to their aid. Germany and Italy will come to their aid. That's very, very unlikely. They actually have no skin on the game. Italy, I'd say more likely than Germany, is more likely to try and get involved on the Allied side. Germany could well get involved on the Allied side to try and get back Singtel, where this all takes place, because... That was a German port and the German based in East Asia prior to World War I when they lost it to the Japanese. So this war would very much give Hitler and give Mussolini a chance for laurels to go and garnish favour. They'd also provide an exceptional cover for the build-up of their own navies and their own forces. Because of course they have to build them up because they're fighting this war alongside you. How can you object? How can Britain and France object to Germany and Italy building up their armed forces if they're fighting alongside them in a war? And when you consider their own timelines of being ready for a war are 42, 43, 44, this would buy them time. It would also buy them mutual support and possibly the chance of some easy wins and may well also buy them tacit acquiescence to their control of certain European areas i.e. probably not Poland but there are other areas where they might well go Frankly, it's not, it's not on our interest. Real politic moment, we're fighting this war versus Japan. So, but I'll get into that more as we go on. There is also the scenario that you have to remember with France and Britain. Because a few people brought up the idea of going, well, why would France be fighting alongside Britain? Remember, at this point, France and Britain are in sort of lockstep when it comes to... Um, their geostrategic position. Well, especially for the French and the British. The British have more independence than the French do, because the British are the bigger power in the relationship. But the French have got a really small navy, and they are still dependent on their global trade, and their they have an empire for their economy to work. And basically, just as, in World War, uh, as you saw in World War One, the French are dependent upon the Royal Navy, the British, providing the maritime security for themselves in certain parts of their, uh, their, their empire and their own nation-state. I.e. the British are supposed to secure the Channel, the North Sea, etc. for any war against Germany. So, France cannot afford to disappoint Britain. Secondly, and this is another big factor. If there is a war in the Far East and it goes off against Britain, the odds are Japan doesn't have control of French Indochina. They don't at this point because the Germans haven't coerced the French into giving it over. 
So they have, they have those bases. They, the options are, therefore, to try and get bases closer to the British in Singapore, Malaya, if they do try and advance towards there. Well, it's either to take your force directly through the South China Sea, not secure anything, and head straight for Singapore, which is what all the defences in, in, in Singapore and, to an extent, Malaya are structured around the idea of you heading straight to Singapore for a coup de main. And remember, again, this is January 1939. All those troops which are trained and know the area, all those forces which know the area, all the good quality soldiers and well-trained-up personnel are out there because it's January 1939. They've not been called back to Britain. They're not fighting in North Africa. They're not fighting in Iran and Iraq. They're not doing anything like that. They are in Singapore. So, they're there. Again, it's not necessarily a good scenario to do that. So, your other option, of course, to get base in the close-up would be to invade the Philippines, which is American-controlled. So, if you were Japan and trying to move forward, which would you more likely go for? Invade France or invade Japan America? Pick... Largest naval, other largest naval power in the world, other than, other than Britain, or one which is smaller than you and barely counts and has to burn. Which one do I invade? You're already at war with Britain. Why attack America as well? They might still do, but please note, I don't recommend it. And plus, you can, you've can you got forces already in China. They're not really located, and you have to take time to organize them and bring them together, supply them, support them to actually make them move south, which would take a long time. It's not going to be a quick build-up. Again, one of the things we're used to talking about with Japan and World War II is, of course, there's this quick campaign which comes straight after they attack Pearl Harbor, and then it's bam, 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 everywhere. What people forget is that all those things are being prepared for for about a year and a half in advance. That's not happened. None of that has happened. None of that has happened. So, you are back in January 1939. They are in the places where they are in January 1939. They're in the state they are in January 1939. So neither side is prepared for this. They will be going with what is available. And I think probably the Dutch will also get involved on the British side, whatever happens. Because again, whilst the Dutch could hang back and try and stay neutral, the fact is, again, rather like the French, their Far Eastern position is anchored on the British being the major power. And Britain being a major power out there, and not supporting Britain it could get them into trouble because even as a neutral power they could still get invaded by Japan and again like France they are the weaker power so there is the potential of Japan going around and going yeah we'll invade the Netherlands of the Dutch East Indies so it's more sensible to form up a sort of central command The Export Control Act, of course, hasn't started implement, so Germany's economy is in a marginally better state, but it's also therefore more vulnerable because it's depending on more imports. Sorry. Next. Well, the Prime Minister of Japan this time is Hiromu Kishiro. I wouldn't call him exactly a nice gentleman, but he's no Tojo. He is a politician, right wing, but more, uh, but marginally more sensible. Uh, the Kida Batai, or the Dashi Koko Kantai, i.e. the air fleet, or the first mobile fleet, uh, is not formed till April 1941, and you're going to work out why that is very quickly once I start getting into the list of carriers. Whilst Suryu was commissioned in December 1937, Hiryu isn't until July 1939. And remember, a carrier being commissioned means you have the ship in service. Not mean does not mean you have the air group worked up on the carrier and everything ready to go. That takes longer. So, yeah. And 
Shikaku isn't even launched till June 1939, and Tsukaku in November 1939, so those ships are going to be a while away. Yamato and Musashi are not launched till August and November 1940. Shinano isn't laid down till May 1940, so no super battleships. And Mitsumasa Yonai is Minister of the Navy. Probably one of the best admirals that Japan has ever produced, and one of the smartest and best strategists Japan has ever produced. We were very lucky that he was considered not pro-war enough and was kept away from command of the war of the Japanese fleets during World War II. Um, as it was, he's the gentleman who's called in by the Emperor after the war is over to oversee the Japanese surrender and make sure the Japanese Navy does what they're supposed to do, because in the Emperor's well, to summarise the Emperor's own words, he's the only one he could trust to do it, and the only one who had the trust and faith of the Navy still, and was popular enough and respected enough in the Navy still, to actually achieve it. His deputy is minister is Isaraku Yamamoto. Yeah. Not, Yamamoto is not the commander-in-chief at this point of the combined fleet. No. He's off being deputy minister to Yonai, who is, in many ways, his mentor. And the commander-in-chief of the combined fleet at this time is Zengo Yoshida, who is no Yamamoto, and certainly no Yonai. The British, well, Prime Minister is Neville Chamberlain. Make it out what you will. Uh, illustrious, formidable, and victorious aren't launched till April, August, and September 1939. So again, British carriers, they are they, they have them, but they're not they're not there yet. Um, Renown was historically not recommissioned till 20th of August 1929 after a major refit. So far, ships immediately available are Hood and Repulse. King George V and Prince of Wales launched in February and May 1939. Um, what tends to come up at this point is someone starts to go. Uh, someone has been asking about Vanguard. Well, Vanguard isn't started till 1940s. So, in the nicest way, if this starts in 1939 and there is no. One of the things I would say in this scenario is there's going to be no pause in capital ship and carrier construction. This is not that type of war. This is not that type of scenario. They're going to carry on. In fact, they're probably going to push effort, emphasis into carrying capital ship construction to fight the Japanese. Under that scenario, therefore, I, Vanguard might well not get built, but the Lions might get built. So that's the point. That's the thing you have to think about. Vanguard, the print, the King George V probably get completed more quickly. The uh, the Armoured carriers probably get completed more quickly. The next generations of them probably get started sooner. But the thing is, with the with the back capital ships, the reason you start the you start Vanguard is because you've had lost capital ships and you need to get one in quickly. Well, if you lose them, then you might need you might need to do a Vanguard. But you also might be going on because again you're going to have your shipyards carrying on without them being bombed, unless. Other powers join the war in Europe. You are Britain's. It, it China changes the war for Britain because, in the nicest way, in the scenario of fighting Japan, as long as Britain can keep its plan and keep Japan where it wants to over that side of the world, British industry, infrastructure, which is far larger than Japan's, is, is completely unaffected by the war. It's got the trade and everything going, and I'll be talking about this later. But it's not going to be getting bombed. It's not going to be having the, pro uh, the the shortages. So basically, all the money of war with none of the problems of actual war in terms of British home industry. And against the power you know has 16-inch guns and you know has large battleships under construction. And again, one of the key books for this work and for this whole discussion is Andy Boyd's in British naval intelligence through the 20th century. And one of the things the British do know is they do know that the Japanese are building big battleships. They do. Now, on top of that, the Queen Elizabeth is going through refit. 
Valiant is only recommissioned from Refit in November 1939, so Warspite is the only upgraded vessel of a class available. I would say there are Japanese carriers and capital ships in some re stages of Refit as well, but my theory, running theory in terms of their operations, is that most of them, and most of the vessels in Refit, will be available to the Japanese quite uh, will be available to the Japanese the moment by the time actual war operations begin and actual war fighting uh, war fighting proper begins rather than posturing and maneuvering around the reason i say that is because well i'll get into it a bit but the reason i say that is because when if you think about it the japanese will probably the moment the ships are ready and uh, have been recommissioned will be they'll be straight into the front line because japan is much closer britain will probably think about going well will we want do we want to work them up and then send them out um those sort of things because again the british have more ships to start off with so the urge to rush these things through is going to be less i'm fairly certain valiant will be hurried up Queen Elizabeth, maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm fairly certain, again, King George V and Prince of Wales will find themselves acceleratum, and Renown will find herself accelerated through her program. But, and Victorious, Middle and Lustrous will find themselves uh, accelerated through. But those are my strong suspicions. 12 to 16 Travel Class Destroyers are in commission. 12 to 15 T-Class submarines are in commission. The remaining three of the T-Class under construction are close to it, not far away from it, and the remaining four of the tribal class destroyers would all be historically being commissioned long before World War II began, so my son, I reckon they'll be brought into service fairly quickly. Interesting point to make is, because of course I talked about the commanders up above for the Japanese, Admiral Cunningham has yet to be appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean Fleet. So Admiral Cunningham could well be sent out to the Far East as Commander-in-Chief. In fact, at this point, was deputising for Admiral Blackhouse, the sixth uh, Sea Lord, on the Committee of Imperial Defence and Admiralty Board. The other officer who is a potential out there, and to be honest, it depends on whether or not how quickly the Americans get involved, who gets out there, sent out there. If the Americans join straight away and go, <gasps> You've attacked the British, you cruel people! We will immediately come to their aid! Da 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 da. Basically, broadly speaking, is what's already happened in the Panay incident where the British came to the American aid and various incidents on the Yangtze River. Whenever the, one or the other was attacked by the Japanese, the other came charging to their aid. So if the Americans do that immediately, because again, a Pacific War is viewed differently in American politics than a European war at this time, and again, in Britain, it's viewed differently. I have a feeling the British commander becomes this gentleman, Lord Keyes. And I have a feeling the fleet commander is Cunningham, but the commander-in-chief is Keyes. Interesting enough, there, of course, there is Percy Noble already out there, who's a very, very skilled admiral and a very good admiral, but that is one of the reasons why you send a... Uh, why you send a... Admiral the Fleet, a five-star out there, to be C&C. &C. Uh, it would be kind of interesting if you consider the precedent kind of brought on in the Pacific. Uh, the British were very happy, uh, considered the Americans the aggrieved party, so were very happy to take a second place, a second fiddle to them in the Pacific, whereas they led in other parts of the world. And even when the British Pacific Fleet was being formed up at the end of the war, well, the British were happy to do it and weren't really contesting this because because of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Americans were considered the aggrieved party, so therefore they should take the lead. If I have a feeling any combined command structure would again depend on how, what time the Americans joined. If the Americans joined, if the Americans uh, joined late, then they're going to have to deal with integrating into a British-led command structure. Uh, that would just be what it would be because the alliance would already be set up and running. If they join straight away, I have a feeling what you might see is a joint staff set up to run the prosecution of war, and you might well have a southwest, uh, a Southeast Asia theatre commander who's leading the fleet. Uh, the fleets coming from Singapore and forces coming up in that direction and a Central Pacific commander who would be an American, and that would be the, two, the, 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 the sort of it'd be an American and British theatres, and they'd both be dealing directions on Japan like that. Um, 
I have a feeling, due to Roosevelt's personal feelings on a certain general called MacArthur, that Roosevelt would have been very happy at any chance to ensure that MacArthur was um, suppressed, for want of a better word. And, again, <laughs> Keyes would be good at that one. Keyes was a very fine political officer when he wanted to be. So, strengths of the na air stre actual strengths of the naval air arms in the first six months. Again, Hiryu is commissioned in July, 16, uh, July 1939, but she is not going to be ready immediately then. So, you've got roughly Arc Royal, 60. Theoretically can take 72, especially with some deck parking going on. Um, Courageous, 48. Can again take some more some deck parking going on. British don't include deck parking numbers in their numbers because of their normal North Atlantic operations, where, frankly, deck parking is a good way to lose aircraft. And the Mediterranean, because they think any aircraft parked on deck will get immediately destroyed in any air attack by light machine gun raking. But, again, they could change that. It depends on the aircraft they're taking with them. And, of course, before people start sort of saying, Gloucester Gladiator, that's, you know... How good is that going to be? We'll get into that discussion, but honestly, they did quite well. The Gloucester Sea Gladiator did pretty darn well over Malta, and some of them in service with various other air arms around the world were surprisingly successful at some very modern aircraft because of their agility, but also because if you're doing the air intercept pattern, they are very capable of getting up to the required height quite quickly and into position and zooming, booming, uh, out maneuvering and doing that thing. They can't catch the enemy aircraft in a chase, but if the enemy aircraft's racing towards them, they can certainly break up the attack and certainly do some damage. Fairy Swordfish, Fairy Swordfish, you know, 48, 36, 28, 20, 15. Uh, Japanese Navy, 15. Akagi, 66, split evenly, plus 25 aircraft in storage. Always useful. Kaga, 72, plus 12 aircraft in storage. Ryojo, 48. Soryu, 63. Hiryu, 64. Now, Ryojo has issues with her top weight. Hosho only carries roughly 15, air, uh, 15 aircraft. Ryojo probably would get used, but I even the Japanese were kind of a bit... Mm, not sure about it. In terms of Britain, I had, do not see them deploying Argus... And probably not Eagle either. I would have a feeling Argus would sit with the home fleet and Eagle would stay back with the Mediterranean. Hermes is out there already. And I think your four options which will get deployed will be Ark Royal, Courageous, Glorious and Furious. They'll be the first ones deployed. However, again, depending on how long the war goes on for, you have very real, a very real possibility of the British getting armoured carriers in the service. I'm not sure about the Japanese getting more aircraft uh, carriers and service, but we'll talk about that. I think they get some, but maybe not as many as they historically get because of the resource issues that the British war plan basically will deliver. So, here is the Aki D3A. Now, this of course is one of the greatest aircraft which the Japanese had available. But notice when it comes into service. Its first flight's in January 1938, but it's not introduced into service until 1940. And by introduction, we're not talking all these units magically are turned into it and turned over to it. No, that's the first squadron starts to receive aircraft. The first squadron starts to convert in, in 1940. In roughly mid-1940, as I understand it. So... You have to think about these things when you're talking about the aircraft availability. When is that going to come in service? And also, remember, that's in peacetime, when the carriers are all back, can all be crawled back, and you can take pilots out and retrain them and all these things. When you're in wartime, it's far more difficult, especially for the Japanese, because of the way they, rotate, they don't rotate their pilots between assignments. The Japanese form up an air wing, and it becomes really, really very, very good and very efficient and very capable. But they don't have a constant throughput of of pilots, and with pilots being withdrawn back to go through training, to train other pilots, and all those scenarios. Whereas the British and the American systems do involve that. 
So uh, what you can do in that sort of circumstances, you can bring back veteran, veteran pilots, train up new pilots on new aircraft types, and then, then deploy the new squadron forward, and then bring back the old squadron and re-change that. So you can do that sort of process. Uh, it's more difficult under the Japanese system. Not impossible. Not, un not They have methodologies. They do it. Please don't sign it. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just more difficult. Primary strike aircraft for the two sides, therefore, will probably be the Fairy Sawfish and Blackburn Blackburn for the British. So, a fairly decent dive bomber and a sort of torpedoes spotter reconnaissance aircraft, which can also do dive bombing, but is well known for being a very good long range, easy to fly night attack aircraft. Please note that emphasis night attack. This is a big part of the Royal Navy doctrine night strikes, night flying. So yes, I would agree the Swordfish is not top trumps in any scenario here. Other than ease of maintenance, and again, think about that from the British infrastructure point of view, the British are going to be supporting this from their base of industry, which is back in the UK, the other side, literally the other side of the world, from where their things are operating. So having aircraft which are incredibly reliable and easy to maintain on literally, and I think I used them an example in the, in the live, a Wren's bra strap being used to, well, not bra strap, the wire, underwire from the Wren's bra, being used to actually replace some of the wires on the wings and on the supporting of the aircraft. Yeah, they're pretty easy to maintain. The principal dive bomber of the Japanese fleet arm at this point is the Aki D-1A, which you can see up there. Uh, the principal strike aircraft is the Yokosuka B-4Y, which is their principal torpedo aircraft. Again, so there's a lot of biplanes still going around in 1939, in January 1939. And the Nakajima B-5N has just started entering service. Just started entering service. And when I say just started entering service, we're talk there is a debate as to when the first units are started being fitted with. We're talking probably March, April not January, in terms of air, uh, starting aircraft starting to appear with squadrons. So they are there, they're coming in. But again, you could have issues going on starting off in January. And the Fairy Albacore. Well, the first flight was the 12th of December 1938, but it's not introduced till 1940. So it's around, but it's not there. Might come in, might get out there, might be deployed out there. It's not really an improvement over the swordfish in many regards, so it might also not. It could do as it historically did and get surpassed by its predecessor. Here is another small problem. The Mitsubishi A6M0. Its first flight is the 1st of April 1939. Its introduction is the 1st of... That can be an issue. That can be an issue in this scenario. Primary fighters, therefore. Well, we have the Blackburn Rock, which is terrible. Please note, I am not claiming it otherwise. It is... The, the idea was that this turreted fighter would go up and blast the... Mm, out of enemy bomber aircraft. The trouble is, it is slower than most bombers are supposed to intercept. It's heavy, it's ungainly, and it's the same idea which produces the Bolton Paul Defiant, and please let's ignore it, in favour of the Gloucester Sea Gladiator, which is gorgeous, pretty nice aircraft, again, not the most advanced fighter in the world, but a very reliable aircraft, and something which the Royal Navy has been seeking to try and replace, they are looking for another single seat fighter, they have been, there have been designs going on for one, but they haven't come about. And that's one of the reasons why the Ferry Fulmar comes into service and all the other things until the Royal Navy gets a single seat divider. Because of the issues that come about with war breaking out when it does in 1939 after the Royal Navy's been... Well, I'll get into that story next in the next slide. And here is the Mitsubishi A5M. One of the prettiest aircraft of its era. It's also a fairly decent fighter. And frankly, I can imagine the dogfights between the A5M and the Gloucester Gladiators, Sea Gladiators will be some of the most beautiful imagery you can ever imagine going on. If we overlook the fact that they will be literally shooting lead at each other and death. 
but you know it will look like some very pretty aerobatic displays now what was I talking about with British uh, with Royal Navy single seat fighters well in 1937, the Gullwing Spitfire scenario, which was considered Type 224, and this was a prototype for it, is sort of canned by the Air Ministry in favour of developing on for what would become the Spitfire. However, it's sort of canned. There seems to be quite a lot of work which goes on into developing it for the Fleet Air Arm, because the Fleet Air Arm needs a single seat fighter. And the trouble is, the wing structure, as they're designing for the Spitfire, and as will eventually be fitted to the Seafire, is not good for carrier deck landings. It puts a lot of strain on the aircraft, and it's one of the reasons why you get issues. Now, please note, this was a prototype. It has fixed landing gear and all sorts of things, which the real one wouldn't have. It was literally a test of concept. It's not the final solution. The Royal Navy, though, were kind of pushing it through, and one of the interesting things you find is that in sort of mid-1939, the Royal Navy's program is, well, from about between February to June 1939, there is a concerted effort by the Air Ministry to cancel the Royal Navy's program with Supermarine because it is dividing Supermarine's efforts and they want them focused on the Spitfire because they're so worried about air defence of the United Kingdom. Um, basically, the RAF, the Air Ministry finally worked up to the fact that they'd been underfunding Fighter Command for the last 15 years, and they needed to actually put some money in. Life happens. And people, uh, in the nicest way, this included some people who are relatively decent, got behind and actually agree with this, including Churchill, because they were just so scared of the bomber threat. But it's absolutely one of those short-sighted manoeuvres you have, and it's one of the reasons why the Royal Navy doesn't have a decent single-seat fighter for World War II, is that the single-seat fighter it was actually in the progress of developing in the late 1930s. It, the programme is cancelled a few months before the war, and it hasn't managed to restart another one and get it further on. So that's why you lead to the Fairy Fulmar and all sorts of things. And one of the reasons why you lead to and get to the low aircraft counts on some of the British carriers, because the British aircraft tend to be bigger, longer, and have more space, because they're all two, two three-seater aircraft. And that's also partially that reason is because of the navigators for the long-range strikeout operations. But the British had been, the Royal Navy had, Fleet Air Arm had been wanting a single-seat fighter for air defence of the fleet. And the idea was the two-seat fighter would be the long-range navigation aircraft, etc. And they're planning night strikes anyway, and so enemy intercepts were unlikely. Uh, remember at this point also, the Royal Navy does have radar being implemented across the fleet. They do have radars in certain sets in service for air defense. And they do have the beacon system for ca aircraft to try and navigate their way back at night to carriers. Now, if you've heard videos, I've discussed the beacons before in various videos... But just to explain the beacon, the navigator would synchronize their watch with the beacon. The beacon would be on a constant rotation of once every 60 seconds. And you synchronize your watch and a second hand with it. And when you heard the beep, you'd check your second hand and you'd know that's the angle that in the center of that clock of your watch is where your carrier is roughly. Uh, that was combined with them dropping off some floats off the back which would light up and last light for about mm, roughly 30 minutes to provide a line for the aircraft to come in. So there was a, ba a whole sort of basket system to make night operations viable. I'm fairly sure the beacons were not perfectly on 60 so uh, not perfectly, uh, you, 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 start, you had to sort of um, sync it up very carefully because I'm fairly sure each carrier was slightly different just as a precaution against the enemy trying to use that to find the carrier. But no, there could have been... One of the scenarios you have to consider in this whole thing is that if you do have war break out in January 1939 in the Far East, where the Royal Navy does need a new fighter rapidly, they do have a program, they can order its rapid construction, and the whole argument of the air ministry, but, 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 we need it more because of the threat to the UK. We're fighting a war. But frankly, we're fighting a war. You will get your Spitfires, you will be fine, we just need a little bit of effort to put together our, fighter, our fighters. And you have to remember, the Supermarine have a history of doing naval aircraft. 
In fact, if it hadn't been for the fleet air arm and naval aircraft, they would have probably gone bankrupt a few times in the interwar years. It's things like the Seagull and various other flying boats which they produce for the Royal Navy's fleet air arm reconnaissance capabilities and for it to fly off their capital ships and their cruisers. Without those, they wouldn't have been able to keep going. So, Supermarine have a close relationship with the Royal Navy. So what I was saying is, yeah, you might end up with a scenario where you have basically gull-wing Spitfires with more with about 1,500 horsepower engines uh, taking on Mitsubishi A6M Zeros in the skies. And again, there is just no part of this war which was... And I please note, I am always careful to say this because I've had some comments of people going, oh, you're glorifying war. I'm not. But from an aesthetic perspective... Those would be some beautiful dogfights. The fact... Yeah, it's not nice that people died. It's not something we want or we want in any scenario. But the fact is, you would have to say those are going to be some aesthetically beautiful dogfights. So, there are... In the live, there are links to various details. Down below in the description, there are links to various details of previous articles and things I've written about the Singtow incident. I've done various videos on the Singtow incident before, but on this channel, so you can go and find out more. So I'm going to give it quickly. Broadly speaking, British flagged and probably British owned Tramper, the SS Vincent, St. Vincent de Paul, is trading in China. This is after the Japanese had taken over control of pretty much all the coast. They come out of where they've been training, trading inland, and they're going off, and the coast, the Japanese-controlled Coast Guard in China, which is controlled by the Imperial Japanese Army, swoops in and takes it into custody, because it's been trading illegally and not paying tax in Japan, as far as they're concerned. Now, at this point, they then take that vessel to Singtown. The Royal Navy hears about this. And very quickly, HMS Birmingham and HMS Folkestone, a Hastings-class sloop, Birmingham, of course, being this lovely, beautiful town-class cruiser, are ordered to proceed post-haste as fast as they can from Manila in the Philippines to there. They arrive in a very unhurried fashion when they're seen, but they get there within a day. This, uh, the vessel ends up in Sing, uh, arriving in Singtao on the 28th. The yes, St. Vincent Paul sort of gets there on the 28th. They get there on the 29th. And then they're having a sort of meetings and trying to discuss things. And everyone's basically passing the block. And so Captain Brin announced that they're leaving. Because this is an imposition on the British flag. Under the rules, you're, what you're supposed to do if you have an issue with a ship like this, which is flagged as a British ship, is you take it up to the Admiralty Courts. There's one in Shanghai. You can lodge a complaint with the British. It is a British flagged vessel. It is therefore under British jurisdiction. And it's not Britain is not in a war with Japan. There is, not a, there is not any war going on as far as the British are concerned, other than Japanese aggression in China. And therefore this doesn't count. And the British so therefore turn up, and basically Captain Brynn announces he's leaving next day. He sticks a midshipman called Ashburton and a chief petty officer, a leading seaman, and some sailors aboard the SS Vincent de Paul to guard it. Some Coast Guardies try and force their way aboard, but they are dissuaded by strong words and the t the phrase. You must go and speak with my captain from Midshipman Ashburton. He ends up an Admiral of the Fleet. He's a very, very sharp young man. And they surprisingly don't go and talk with Captain Brind. They avoid him completely. Next day, they leave. As they leave, all three of the Ashigara class who are in there, and I'm not quite sure which of the three it is, which three of the four it is, uh, I am fairly certain that's the identity of two, but there's one I'm not sure about, and that's pro I'm hoping to um, get to Oxford 
at some point to have actually some time in the correct section of the Bodleian Library and Bodleian Archive to look up the records of the consul who was there at the time, who was a bit of a fi who was a bit of a ship spotter. And I'm fairly certain he will have an accurate retelling. All I found from his notes, though, which were apparently very, very inclusive in the National Archives, are the index, because that's the only part of the files which has been saved. Helpful. We didn't save any of the content files. We saved the index. Anyway, as they leave, the Ashigara vessels, Ashigaras, point their guns at HMS Birmingham. And HMS Birmingham, in turn, points her guns at each of their ship, or oh, each of the three ships, points a different turret at each of the three ships, and its fourth turret at the headquarters. And please note, we're talking ranges of as little as 60 meters between these ships. So. This is not a scenario where you can go 6-inch versus 8-inch cruisers. Yeah, it's going to be... No. Um, there was a significant discussion during live as to exactly what would happen, and there have been some comments afterwards. I do agree that neither side really has guns which will be able to depress far enough to actually fire into each other's hulls, but the sheer amount of damage they will do at that range... And again, nice way, it doesn't matter if you find 6 inch or 8 inch. At 60 meters, it's, there is no, no difference um, in what the damage you're going to have done to these ships. I do not see any of these ships getting out of there and being actually usable. They would all be wrecked. They might still be afloat, but that's basically more a testament to the fact that they're still afloat than they're actually usable. Nothing happens, they go out to sea. And honestly, I don't think anything would happen at that point. I would say the likely flashpoint comes afterwards, because this group is not going to move fast, this convoy, and if the Imperial Japanese Army replay, uh, complain up, and complain up and go up to the Prime Minister, which is, of course is Hiran Hin Hiranuma uh, Kishiro, if they go and complain up to him, then he could well order the Navy to go and recover the Japanese honor. In which case, you have a problem of them either trying to stop the convoy or actually just attacking the convoy in the middle of the ocean. Either will probably lead to combat. And at range, three heavy cruisers will, of course, win against the town. Uh, I have this... I've done some simulations, and... Due to the fact they need to do, would need to do a positive identification and they'd need to probably get within visual range for communicating, uh, it seems to me likely that at least under those likely scenarios when I've tested them, at least one of the Ashigaras gets sunk. But in the nicest way, none of the British ships go away. None of them get away, they all get destroyed. So they go down fighting, but they, they, don't, they, they go, they're gone. Um, usually it's their, it's torpedoes, it's torpedoes from the Bir uh, Birmingham which does the damage to uh, Nashigara. There was one scenario where my friend who was um, in charge of the other ships tried the idea of breaking up the Japanese cruisers and having one coming up port, one to port, one to starboard, and one aft, and that scenario actually ended up worse for him because I managed to use the torpedoes port and starboard from Birmingham to go both ways. I, I still ended up losing, but, you know, I took out two cruisers that time. He was trying, he, he was trying for intimidation, and honestly, Brind... Again, there's a link to his Wikipedia page down below, because it's where I can find the best photo of him. Sorry, it is. Uh, and, um, yeah, he's not the type to back down. He's not going to back down. It's it's not a sensible thing for Britain to do. Backing down at this point is not a sensible thing. The entire Far East position is pretty much a bluff, and has been a bluff for many, many years, which is maintained by that bluff, in order to buy time for the reality of the position for the Navy to actually deploy. Uh, you can't afford to back down from that bluff. And all the Royal Navy captains know that. And that's going to affect their decision making. 
So, war aims. Well, Japan, their war aims are easy because they're pretty much the same war aims they have in 1941. Um, I've emphasized the Britain in this scenario, but that's because it could just... In 1941, it's US and the rest of the West. In, Britain, in this scenario, it's get Britain and the rest of the West, if possible, out of China and secure position as a great power. For Britain, the war aim is slightly more difficult. It would be destruction of Japan as a threat. Frink British war aims versus Germany in World War I. No navy, no ability to build a navy. They honestly don't care about much else. If allies join, though, expected to expand and move Japan out of China, possibly Tsingtao for Germany, there is a problem once you get allies involved. They're going to have a view. They always have a view. And opinions. It's terrible. It's, it's the real problem. Once you start getting allies involved, they are going to have an opinion. But the other thing you have to remember about those allies and their opinions is they can have all the opinions they like, but their actual ability to deliver on those opinions is going to depend on how much force they deploy. So if it's a British-led coalition the Americans don't take part, then frankly the vast majority of others will just have to do whatever the British say. Um, because the British don't want to enforce it, it isn't going to happen. However, if the Americans join in, you then have an alliance of, in 1939, and not on this scenario, of, broadly speaking, equals British Empire and the United States. In which case, you will have a strong discussion going on, and those two will set the terms between the two of them. For America, this will mean Japan out of China. Uh, for... Britain, that will mean needing to secure the, her position so that Japan out of China doesn't result in America taking over China and therefore uh, Britain being out of China. It's basically 3D mental chess of diplomacy. So, Japanese versus British strategy. Broadly speaking, the whole idea is very Greeks versus Romans. Japan is that you destroy enough of the enemy in a single battle, you then negotiate peace from a position of strength. This is based on their own in their own actual weakness to an extent. The best they can hope for is to destroy the enough of the enemy that the enemy decides to negotiate with them. Neither fighting Britain nor America can they prosecute the war to the extent that they can dictate terms. And what do I mean by that? To prosecute war to the extent you can dictate terms, you need to be able to invade the homeland of a nation and dominate it. Or you need to be able to sufficiently destroy the nation. Which would mean they would need to protect and project and blockade Britain. Or they would need to invade the United States. The United States being a con uh, being pretty much a continent, of a continent, you need to invade it. Britain, you could technically blockade it and do to it what... Britain plans to do to you. However, for both those scenarios, Japan will need to build a lot of infrastructure and set itself up and grow itself massively, and it just doesn't have it. Britain is you keep fighting till the other side can't fight anymore, then you pummel them some more to make sure of that, and then you tell them what the peace is going to be. Again, if you consider World War One, there is a certain argument that the final offensives were not necessary. They were just making sure that, that the Germans understood, the German government understood, what was capable, what was happening, and what was coming its way. If we look at the British history in warfare, it is broadly speaking that, and that is their scenarios. If you consider their war plans for Japan, they are nothing short of Whilst they don't involve an invasion of the Japanese home islands as a rule, they do involve the absolute strangulation of those home islands when you consider how much they depend upon the importation of food, uh, importation of resources and raw materials and the sea for food, etc. And they are planning on cutting off everything. Everything. It's the British way of war. So, Japan, you have both imperial defense policy and imperial defense doctrine. I tekoku koku, uh, kokubo hashin, and tekoku yohei koryo. 
and these can sometimes agree, they can sometimes disagree. But one of the things they do agree, and sometimes they are used interchangeably, and sometimes they... they there is a rhyme and a reason to it, but it is sufficiently complicated that it would be its own three hour video to explain it, or I can just tell you to go and read Kaigen, um, which is very, very good and will explain it to you. Um, over the course of about four, uh, four, possibly five chapters. But what, broadly speaking, you find in all of them is a paragraph in the beginning which, broadly speaking, says this. The Navy shall conduct operations aimed at annihilating the seaborne forces of the enemy insofar as possible by forestalling him and the army at gaining the advantage of holding initiative by rapidly concentrating the required forces in an area before the enemy can do so. That's the consistent mantra of Japanese defense thinking. So, specifics of the Kantai Kesson, because I know someone is going to say, ah, oh, they're going to go for the decisive battle doctrine. It's going to be the Kantai Kesson. Probably. But, it's going to be an interesting application. Uh, a Kantai Kesson, for its work, you have to achieve a local superiority of force that allows you to overwhelm your enemy to deliver a devastating blow onto them. In which case you have a problem, but also an opportunity fighting the British, if you're Japanese. This will normally be achieved by a concentration of the total fleet force. It is rooted to an extent in one interpretation of Mahan. Key points to look for. It's against the significant portion of the enemy fleet. If it's not, it's not the Kantai Kesson. Is it a majority of portion or even hold the Japanese fleet operation? Again, if it isn't, it's probably not a Kantai Kesson. And because of the latter requirement, it will tend to be conceived as taking place closer to Japan as the risk of long-range deployment of such force is, the scare is problematic. Again, in this scenario, that's actually helpful. And there is actually a potential scenario where the Kantai Kesson could come, uh, could come about. You're looking at most likely the East China Sea in this scenario. Is it adaptable? It will not be applied the same way against the weaker power as it will be a superior power. A weaker power the Japanese fleet would seek out. A superior power they would want to come to them. Think about that. Yugeki Zengen Sakusen, or Interception Artrition Operations. This strategy, which had in fact become dogma by the 1930s, entailed the following operations. And this comes from Yoki Ayoshi Hirama. Who is the Japanese that wrote, wrote about the Japanese naval preparations for World War II? Naval College Review, Spring 1991, Volume 44, Number 2, Page 64. At the start of hostilities, the Navy would destroy the U.S. Asiatic Fleet in cooperation with the Army, seize Luzon in the Philippines, and Guam. These actions would eliminate the American strongholds in the Western Pacific. This is, of course, their war plans for war against the Americans. British, it's basically seize Hong Kong. Uh, second, submarines would proceed to the Eastern Pacific, where they would monitor the movements of the main American fleet. They would track the American forces it set out westward and attack it repeatedly to measure its strength. Third, naval aircraft based in the South Seas mandated islands here for after in Micronesia would attack the enemy once he came within range. Carry-borne aircraft would further reduce its strength. Fourth, an advanced body of cruisers and destroyers supported by fast battleships would deal a major blow to the American fleet in a night attack. This would occur once the enemy had reached the seas, designated for the decisive battle, and would constitute the first phase of this battle. The second and final phase would follow at daybreak, when the full weight of the main fleet would be thrown against the American fleet annihilated. Okay, this is an interesting idea, but just think about how the differences are when you're fighting the British. Okay, the British Asiatic fleet is cruisers. They are based at Weihai Wei, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and could well start withdrawing to Singapore fairly quickly. Hong Kong is a small base, but they're going to be coming up from the South China Sea. That's where Britain will bring to Singapore and then surge from there. Uh, the Americans, of course, have made decisions because of the long-range nature of their operations about putting hydrophones in their cruisers, etc., and ASDIC in their cruisers, etc., whereas the British do have those things. The Americans, so, of course, not ASDIC. Um, so the British cruisers and British uh, the British have a lot more ships as a percentage of force, which are anti-submarine warfare vessels. Please note, this is, n this is a legacy of World War I. Abercrombie, Cressy, and Hogue. Ab no, Abercur, Cressy, and Hogue. Abercur, Cressy, and Hogue. Nice way the Royal Navy had a disaster on its hands in World War One. There is a reason they're as obsessed with anti-submarine warfare as they are in World War Two, and it's due to World War One. 
So, again, submarines will probably still try and ha have an effect, but they will also be fa facing a far more, how do I put this, multiplication of effort, of effort, in that if you have more capital ships, etc., hydrophones and uh, ASDIC on your um, cruisers, as well as usually hydrophones on them, you have more options for hunting those submarines, you have more of a concentrated, uh, you have more of a force listening out for torpedoes, it has an impact on long-range torpedo attacks as well. Because the British zigzag, as a rule, the British are obsessed with zigzagging, again, because of torpedoes. And that has an impact on your long-range torpedo aiming. Because if you're aiming torpedoes at long range, you need to be able to predict where the enemy's going to be. Because and if they're zigzagging, because those zigzags will never be perfect. Then there will always be a slight randomness on it. It's very difficult to predict where they're going to be at a time at which your torpedoes will reach that area. So... Also, finally, Americans, of course, do not have battle cruisers. The Royal Navy, as I pointed out, have Hood and Repulse immediately available, have Renown certainly available quite soon. They also have Prince of Wales and King George V, which are not too slow, coming up and able to be in service in a while. The vast battleships, i.e. the, the enhanced Congos, the refitted and repair, uh, refitted Congos would find themselves fighting things which could fight back very nastily. And again, that's going to change Japanese doctrine and Japanese tactics. If you're fighting the British, you are fighting a different scenario than if you're fighting the Americans. Both are equally capable, but in different ways, and you adjust your strategy around them. Yoguki Isakusen, ambush and strategy, is a key part of this. Now, when I was discussing all this, I was looking back at some of the comments of some previous videos I've done about Japanese strategy and things and their development. And I noticed this comment came in literally on the day I was preparing these slides. And it was about the Yamato, Yamato, Yamato class. And it's from BK Zhong. The Yamatos weren't supposed to be deterrents, though. They were intended to seem less powerful and capable than they were really were, so an enemy force would send what they thought was an adequate battleship force against them, only to end up being outmatched. To use your security system analogy, the point was less to deter robbers than to catch them in the act and get them arrested. And once everyone switched to using it, carriers in the Pacific battleships weren't effective deterrents anyway, because both the US and Japan were far more concerned with each other's carriers. Okay. Starters. Um... The last paragraph, if I'm just going to do sort of a quick historian point on this, and I know I know where this idea is coming from. I I have heard there is a book which is in English language, so I haven't read it, which does sort of produce this sort of ideas. Um, so let me. It don't consider it a reflective view, Jong. It's this is a response to the comment which I think has, might have come from this book. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but it's my suspicion. Okay, the last paragraph. The terror. What the reasons you construct a ship are not the uh, uh, do not retroactively change. So just because in 1942 you are now concentrating on aircraft carriers rather than battleships doesn't change why you were building a ship back in the 1938-1939. It doesn't mean that you suddenly go go. <gasps> I've had knowledge from 1942. <gasps> we're constructing the ship for the wrong reason. Doesn't happen. Okay, that's just not there. So that paragraph is neither here nor there to the reason the Emoto class were built and how it informs us on their strategy. Also, when you are trying to con people into believing your ships are less powerful and capable than they are, and less powerful and capable than theirs, don't make them bigger. Okay? The problem with the Emoto class for that scenario, and this is the big issue with them, is they are... 71,000 tons on trial. 72,809 tons fully loaded. They are mahusive. Mahusive. Than the ships which you've built under the treaty system, which have a top, a top standard displacement of 35,000 tons. No one is going to believe that that thing is weaker. If you, I do know where that comes from in the ambush strategy, and people did, were talking at the time about building capital ships for ambush strategy, but in the nicest way, under those scenarios, you build something of roughly 40,000 tons standard displacement maximum, probably aim for about 36, 38,000 tons. 
and you pretty much fit it out with six 18 inch guns in two triple turrets forward so it becomes a sort of Rodney, Nell Rod style ship um, if you do that you could probably pretend they were weaker you could probably pretend they were but once you're building something of this style this size with nine 18 inch guns three triple turrets again British Naval Intelligence they know something's going on they're estimating it's turret it's, they actually have a rough estimate I think it's about 17 and a half inch they believe the, turret, uh, the guns are on rather than 18 inch so they're a bit off but again no one's going to think ah yes but well, I've heard it's a 17 and a half inch and it's got 9 guns and it's this size and going to think oh it's we it's weaker than my ships everyone and the Americans and the British both have the intelligence going and through the Japanese they have an idea what's there it is a deterrent and there is a reason for this because it's actually built and there are actual discussions which show it's built under the strategy of the Taiken Koyo Shugi the big ships big guns that is the defining construction policy of Japanese capital ships and was their defining policy from probably about 1898 onwards it is absolutely critical to understanding Japanese defense, uh, Japanese capital ship procurement and if you look through their large armored car cruisers, their battleships of the pre and battleships of the pre dreadnought era, their dreadnoughts and these vessels being built prior to World War II they all fit with it. And they're all part of a deterrent strategy. So, Kantai Kesson is probably what they're going to go, but they're probably going to go for an attrition. And they're probably going to go for waiting for the British to come to them. They want the British fleet to come to them. They might well, the army and navy might well take Hong Kong. That I think they would do. But I have a feeling rather than charge Singapore, they would wait for them to come. Which also makes sense from perspective of their own uh, capabilities. The British war plan. Think Anaconda plan from the American Civil War. The British are not planning on charging in. So please note, this is one of the reasons why um, there is a very nice gentleman called Knight6831 who, if you've listened live, you'll hear me chatting with beginning because he does excellent research and goes off and comments on many of the videos. And in this scenario he, he was talking about, you know, the, the capability of the if we go back to it, the wonderful and very, very capable B five N. This aircraft here. It's one of the best torpedo bombers produced in World War Two, without a doubt. But it had just entered service and was just entering service in that 1839 period and it's going to take resources to get there and he basically writes well doc you're going to have to come up with something very good tomorrow because to get the iron out of slaughter they would have because of the superior the Japanese torpedo bombs were correct and my response to that is well both the Japanese plan is to wait for the Brits to come to them and the British plan is to well this yeah, those are cruisers around the world, and that's a, called a distant blockade of Japan. And it's based on this. The Royal Navy had spent, ooh, I would say the best part of the last hundred years keeping a very accurate track, uh, along with assistance occasionally from the Board of Trade in certain data, um, on world trade and where ships were and where ships were going. This would lead in January 1940 to the Asamamaru incident, where the British pluck a Japanese merchant vessel. They are equivalent of, in national pride, of the QE2 today and sort of the Titanic in its time, etc. Uh, although not suddenly on scale, Titanic. Um, from the sea off the coast, uh, not far from Tokyo Bay, and take German merchant sailors who were trying to get back to Germany via the long way, offer in almost in within visual range of Japanese coast. 
the British have a very, very accurate information system going on on merchant marine and trade and the movement of goods. And their plan is to literally protect their own, because you can see this is a map of British trade. Where is the British trade? It's all going around this through the Atlantic coast of the America, South America, huge amount of trade through the Mediterranean to India to Australia. There's a little bit going up the coast of China. There's a little bit going between China, Japan, and America. But basically, British economic empire is all behind Singapore. If you secure Singapore, the British economic empire behind can run completely independently and not worry about Japan. Keep the British economy going almost as if it's peacetime. So you look at this and you look at the cruisers and this is where they plan to base their modern cruisers in a war. And this is one of the reasons why the British were obsessed with the idea of maintaining 70 cruisers to carry out this operation. They have a plan for 28 cruisers at Hong Kong, but that's if they get to Hong Kong to help them imposing a blockade on Japan. But the rest of the cruisers are spread out around uh, the Gilbert Islands, Australia, Singapore, Truk, it's all spread out. And Britain, of course, remember, has fuel stores all across the Far East built up for this. In Truk, in Ceylon, well, Trim Comely, in Australia, in Darwin, and in Singapore itself, there are huge stockpiles of fuel built up to support naval operations. All the Royal Navy has to do is get the ships out there, and they will be able to get the fuel for, get, keep them operating, and they'll be able to resupply. But they will have such big stockpiles there, they'll be able, the, the supply needs will be a case of, yeah, we can do whatever we want, and as long as the supply keeps coming, the odds are we will never run out. And that is what they'll do. And remember again, with the refineries and various other things they have in this area anyway, they just get the fuel from the Middle East and take it straight there. So they only bring the fuel across the Indian Ocean. Now, one of the things you would know is that the British would still keep building things like the flower class corvettes, which they order in 1938 and lay down in 1939. They'd still be building those. Because you would need them for carrying out some parts of the blockade and escorting those merchant ship convoys. But also because the British, just because they're at war with Japan, doesn't mean they're going to start suddenly trusting Italy and Germany. And again, there's always the Japanese have a very good submarine arm. There's always the chance they actually turn them loose on merchant trade. So they're going to keep building them. Their purpose is probably going to be orientated around the Indian Ocean. They're probably going to start doing convoy escorts there. But again, the British will be building up these uh, these vessels just as they did historically. Hunt class escort destroyers, Black Swan class sloops, and the Flower class corvettes. The Black Swan class sloops actually could get built a lot more of because you won't have the same restrictions on raw materials, which leads to the reduction in issues with producing turbines. So you'll be able to grow your turbine manufacture, etc., far more quickly and far more capable. So you might actually get more Black Swan class sloops. And basically, the British plan is to blockade off Japan, blockade them, and then slowly tighten the blockade down. Very slowly. Build up their fleet in Singapore. Build up their forces in Singapore. Build, uh, build, put their crews in position, stop Japanese trade going on around the world, and then slowly start to crunch down on Japan. So you could be talking the British waiting six, eight months before they start moving up to Hong Kong. Might even be a year. The British will be, again, if you look at the British economy, they're going to be not affected by this. As long as they don't have problems elsewhere in the world, and they might not, especially if they manage to get others involved, they have this going on. They're able to keep pushing down on the Japanese and then move up. So Japan, in return, in in, in consequence, in you know contrast, they're not going to have the resources they built up prior to World War Two. Their resources they built up 
based on the American Act and the limitations which that caused and the fact they had to respond by building up and fuel and trying to get resources they could and stockpiling as much resources as they could, they haven't done that. They haven't managed to do that yet. They were still build, stockpiling resources. They're actually stockpiling resources at this point that would go on towards supporting that. So they're not going to be getting those resources in either. So they have a huge trouble in this. So you have Britain in this scenario, which has more industry and infrastructure to start with, but is uh, further away, will be getting its supplies uninterrupted, and Japan is closer, but will have a lot of issues with supplies. And again, there are some links down below to the work of Richard Dunley, who was one of my colleagues from one of my PhD programs during King's, and who's now teaching at Canberra, you know, at Canberra, um, and who was on Bilge Pumps this week's episode of Bilge Pumps, where he actually looks at the British forensic case of how they planned their war against Japan. And the British have been studying the Japanese economy very, very intently for the previous 20 years at least. And knew exactly what play, what things came from the British Empire for J that Japan was dependent upon, and knew exactly what things came from South America, etc., where Britain had large interests and very a uh, lot of influence came from, and they were planning on stopping it off there before it even got anywhere near to going to on a ship to Japan. So they were planning on lessening the jobs for their cruisers greatly. And then we have the fighting instructions for the Royal Navy. Now, the Royal Navy's doctrine for night fighting involves capital ships and other everything getting close. Basically, their entire idea for the night fighting is... Well, I would say the Japanese version of night fighting basically is a guerrilla action. It's light, fast attacks to try and wear the enemy down. The British version of night fighting is a mugging. That's the closest thing you can get to. There is an actual scenario which is taught to Cunningham by Fisher, who unfortunately is, de is dead by And by Fisher, I mean John Fisher, not Jackie Fisher. John Fisher is one of the best admirals the Royal Navy has in the 1920s, and uh, he is probably one of the best admirals the Royal Navy's ever had in terms of his ability to think. It was him, Henderson, Cunningham, to an extent Chatfield, but less so, who come up with the night fighting ideas for the Royal Navy and how they're going to fight. And, of course, the unfortunately lost before, war began Blackwood. Now, before World War II began Blackwood. The point is, their version of night fighting involves a very simple scenario. You point your guns at the enemy. You know where they are, you found them, especially if you've, you've managed to find them with your aircraft and you keep track of them all day and all night, all, all day, uh, in sort of all, into the evening and at night with the aircraft. You send your, night, your aircraft into attack with their torpedoes at night. They go and attack with their torpedoes. They drop flares on the enemy position and the enemy ships to illuminate them. And the, in the dark, they're dropping flares on them. So they know someone's out there and coming. And you point your guns at them, and you get close, and you get very close, and you wait until they start to play with their own guns, and then you open fire. So you get as close as you possibly can. Now, strange enough, during the day, I have no qualms of saying Japanese naval aviation will dominate in the beginning of 1939. They will dominate. They are, have, especially, sort of, they will have slightly more aircraft, they have certainly more fighters. And their strike aircraft are better day fight uh, day aircraft, and the uh, well, they're about equivalent to the uh, in the case of the um, B four. But you know, they're not bad. So they, I have a feeling, you know, in daytime they would have an advantage. At night, they would be in real trouble. And the other main problem the Japanese have is, of course, if you're doing long range torpedo launches, etc. If your enemy's zigzagging, that's the problem. If you know where they are. You're okay, but again, you have to know where they are. And again, the British have radar and are pushing radar out, and again, the entire structures. If you're hearing weird noise, that's a fox. I don't think it's one of the ones I look after. And the British will be looking for getting close and doing something nasty. 
and again you've got the tribal class destroyers which are orientated around that remember they do the whole night uh, they do their whole night engagement is to fix shit targets by blasting over their 4.7 inch guns and lighting fires on the decks of bigger destroying smaller vessels sweeping destroyers etc aside is their plan but if they can but also lighting fires using 4.7 inch shells on cruisers on capital ships decks using them and so those fires will illuminate the positions on that ship and which means that the other destroyers which are torpedo orientated will be able to launch their torpedoes more accurately because they have a have a ship on fire to focus on it's it's all very very brutal so what likely happens well this depends on when the usa joins because i'm fairly certain the usa does join a war in the pacific is not seen as like war in europe b the other issue and the other scenario is that for both Britain and America, a war with Japan where the other one goes to war and wins, and both presume that the other one will win, because both have that level of arrogance, racism, call it what you will, it's mostly arrogance more than anything else, but there is always a healthy leavening of the other, of other nastier things then they will see their own position in China, in Asia, threatened. So they can't afford the one to fight the war without the other. I No, they can't afford for the other one to fight the war and then not be involved. So I think America gets involved pretty darn quickly. But if it's Britain, France and Netherlands, then it's very much pure this strategy. This British strategy. If it is Britain, Empire, plus USA, plus European allies, and especially they form an alliance, this then creates a very different, another scenario, okay? Because if you're Germany and Italy, now, again, remember when Mussolini and Hitler signed their agreement Hitler promised Mussolini war wouldn't come till at least 1943, as the Italian preparations for war weren't going to be complete till 1942. If you've got America, Britain, France, and Netherlands, and probably some other allies, Britain and the sort of Empire, all already geared up fighting a war and fighting a war alongside each other, annoying them or attacking them does not make a smart decision. Now, they still might do it. Please note, I'm not saying they won't necessarily do it, but I'm saying there's a scenario where you attack them where you think you can divide and rule, and there's a scenario where you attack them where you already know they're fighting as alliance, already on full alert, and they're already fighting and committed and involved. And there's also, as said, potential advantages for joining up, for joining up the alliance. It's Again, it, the, thing I, the one I consider most likely to get involved is Il Duce. Now, admittedly, supporting his ships out in the Far East would be an absolute logistics nightmare, and the British would probably be crying and telling the Americans, please take them, they're such a pain in the... Mm. But um, they would probably get sent. And they would probably join in on the European side. So they could be seen as the defenders of Europe against the evil East. And... I have the suspicion that Hitler does the same, literally for Singtao, because if he can recapture Singtao, that is such a laurel. You know, Kaiser, the Weimar Republic had lost Singtao in the Treaty of Versailles and after the siege of Japanese, and he recaptures it. I could see that being such an, a massive propaganda lure that he actually goes for it and thinks he can do it. And I could honestly see the British having troubles with the Germans basically going off and being them, their own annoying people to try and get to Singtao and probably the British actually just letting them go and going, yeah, if you survive and take it, woohoo. If you don't, meh, life's on you. But this does mean that you get a combination of Rainbow 5 with... The British plan and as I said I think probably what happens is the Americans do acquiesce to the British plan for the first few months while they themselves build up because remember again the Americans haven't had the two years of war 1939 to 1941 at this point to build up 
So the Americans are in just the same position as the British at the beginning of 1939. So I think the Americans rather like the British strategy. And remember, there's been no Pearl Harbor, so there's been no agreement on the Americans. However, I think, again, you get a theatre structure, and I think the Americans would go across the central, uh, central um, Pacific once they'd built up and once everything had been implemented, and the British would work their way up. However, I think you would have naval task forces moving between the two theatres, depending on where they're needed, and I wouldn't be surprised if, especially for the retaking of Hong Kong and some other scenarios, you could have a task force, a combined force involving Ark Royal, Lexington, Courageous, Saratoga, Glorious, Yorktown, Furious, Enterprise team up, probably with added illustrious class vessels. Just think about that for the fun of it. Um, I, it's That is a very realistic scenario in my mind for late 1939, early 1940. Depending on when they move, move for Hong Kong. I could see the horses coming together because they would, for, they could well consider that a likely scenario for the Japanese to come out and fight if they're going to Hong Kong, and therefore they would mass every single ship they could there. And remember again, if you've got the Americans on your side, you're going to have the support of the Philippines for the Hong Kong operation. So you're going to have long-range air reconnaissance and all sorts of things going on. So what likely happens? Well. I'm gonna. I've got plans. What the question is going to be after afterwards at the end of this, but I have got four roughly naval air battle scenarios which are possible. And please note these are possibilities. This one is my least likely possibility of a scenario. This is that the Japanese decide to contest the Singapore Straits by racing with whatever pair of carriers they have available, um, which I think would be Akagi and Soryu as fast as they can to try and get down through the South China Sea for Singapore to try and launch an attack on any British force which gets that. Now, this is not a good decision for the Japanese to make. A, if you catch Hermes in daytime, you will win. But if you don't, and she has her 15 swordfish and manages to launch a strike on you at night time, she might well cause some damage. She might sink something, she might not. It's, again, it's moving at night and it's only 12, 15 swordfish, whatever she launches a strike. Uh, these are things that are going to be issues. But, more importantly, you're going into a teeth of an area which has submarines, has cruisers, has sloops which can lay mines and has its own aircraft including Vickers Wildebeest torpedo bombers and the British aren't going to be arriving there as quickly as you can so you will probably get there before the British do now your other option is to wait until you think the British are going to turn up and then charge down there but again if you're charging down a South China Sea the odds are you're going to be charging straight into the path of British ambush mines or British submarines and Britain does have a mine laying submarine out in the Far East from memory and of course expect an ideal class or to be actually getting out there as quickly as possible so you have a problems in that front you could end up losing a carrier for no win and it's going against every part of Japanese strategy. Honestly, when I put it, to, uh, sort of thinking about it, and I was thinking, what are the likely carriers which get out to the Far East first? I would say probably Ark Royal and Glorious are the two most likely to get out to the Far East at first in this time. So they could be there, and in which case, Swordfish, Sea Gladiators, Skewers versus what you are bringing and of course the land-based aircraft which are there I don't think includes the Brewster Buffaloes I don't think they're there yet um, Vickers Wildebeest especially the land-based torpedo bombers and other aircraft and the reconnaissance aircraft the uh, scout planes that 
powerful flying boats that are there, all makes that a very, very dangerous proposition. In fact, I would say most likely it results at best in you destroying both British carriers but also losing both your own, in which case that's more of a problem for Japan than it is for Britain, because Britain's able to replace, because of infrastructure and because of the effects of the blockade, its carriers far easier than Japan is. And it gets even worse if America's joined the, joined the war group, because then you've got to get past the Philippines, you've got to get past all that scenario, and get down to Singapore. I don't think the Japanese do this. I think it's the most stupid thing they could do, and I doubt they would. However, a few months into the war, Britain and its allies going to retake Hong Kong. More important if they don't have the Americans on their side, Philippines and Manila, but even if they do have the Americans and Philippines and Manila on their side, it is useful for supporting the, China, the, the Republic of China forces and giving them aid. If you can get Hong Kong, you can actually start supplying them a lot easier, especially if you, so you can get, as you can, with Rev's view, especially if you're building things like the flag class corvettes, etc., secure convoys up to Hong Kong on a regular basis from Singapore, and you can have those convoys going up to Hong Kong and keep a regular flow of supplies going into the Chinese forces to assist them and into Hong Kong and into Shanghai. And if you can secure Hong Kong, you can probably secure Shanghai as well. Now, that's going to be an amphibious operation, but it's also going to be an operation which is going to require a lot of carrier support. And this is a chance at which the Japanese might choose to come and interfere. They might have submarines already arrayed at Hong Kong and that area, and they might well choose to come south, uh, come south and engage. But again, you have a small problem. So, Japanese codes. They have various codes, and at various points we start reading them, and different people have different information on when you start reading them. There is some interesting information in the British Naval Intelligence there book about how much information the British had on Japanese codes. Now, the thing is, you can be unsure in peacetime, because you're not going to make a guess because you don't have to, but with the penetration they did have and the knowledge they did have, I have a feeling that they would quite quickly develop an understanding of Japanese codes. Even if they didn't, with the sufficient air reconnaissance which you'd have thanks to the Philippines and long-range aircraft, B-17Gs, and flying boats in the Philippines areas, etc., operating around, well, B-17s, I don't think it's Gs at this point, I think it'd be, is it Fs, or would it be the earlier variants, probably the earlier variants, actually, uh, flying around you probably would see any Japanese strike force coming or trying to loiter with intent to come and attack. They'd also probably be having to coordinate with the Imperial Japanese Army ashore, who would have their aircraft ashore, and that is notoriously a weak link in Japanese communications, any communications which go between Japan and the Army. So these things could well tip off the Allies they're coming. In which case you have a race. If the Japanese manage to still confirm the position of the Allies first in daytime, and they have the B-5s in service, and it's... If the B-5s are available in significant numbers, and they do manage to catch the Allies in daylight, then there could be significant damage to the Navy, uh, to the ships. But especially if you have an Anglo-American-led force with those combined carriers, I think they would have sufficient aircraft, sufficient fighters up, and may even have, as said, it might even there might even be a gullwing Spitfire hanging around there. That they get their own back as well. They do launch counterattacks and do strikes. However. There is a more likely scenario based on the information reconnaissance assets available and intelligence assets available that they know the Japanese are coming. And during the night, the British launch airstrikes. And they keep up those airstrikes. And then during the day, at first dawn, first light, the Americans launch their massive alpha strike, guided in by British reconnaissance aircraft, which are uh, positioned still near where the Japanese fleet are watching them. 
without need to search the Japanese, knowing exactly where they are, they can carry maximum fuel, maximum weapons, go straight there, and yeah, the one-two punch, a night of being attacked by British aircraft, dropping flares, torpedoes, and dive bombing, and then daytime, whatever's left gets alpha striked by the, by the US Navy. I'm fairly sure followed up very quickly by a load of <clears throat> rather large capital ships hoving into view, going tally-ho, under either the leadership of, well, it could well, uh, they could well be under the leadership of, well, we'd, you'd hope Xing Li, but um, there are some fairly decent British carrier, uh, British battleship officers as well. Uh, Fraser is an example, but he, of course he did take over Third Sea Lord after after Henderson died. Um, and of course there is the Battle of Denmark Straits, most famous officer. Admiral Lancelot Holland, who could well also be put in charge. It's going to depend who exactly is there and what exactly for, uh, for forces they have available. I could see, uh, in my scenario in this, the overall fleet commander could well be Cunningham, with an American commanding the capital ships. I could see that being a scenario, and it might even be one of the senior, one of the admirals from the Pacific Fleet, one of the senior ones are there. Um, I say Ching Li, I'd hope for him, but it probably isn't, because it's probably not the right time for him to be there. But either way, that is probably not a good, the good size of battle for the Japanese, and probably ends up with Gomda destroyed. But again, they might not. They might let the Allies bash themselves against Hong Kong, and the IJN might decide that's the IJA's job to hold it. Frankly, we don't care. We're going to wait for them to get to the East China Sea. When they're away from the support of the Philippines. In which case, you end up with this. Now, the East China Sea, again, that would be after Hong Kong. So this would be probably well into 1940. Okay, war has been running a little over a year at this point. There is definitely armored carriers out there. There are American carriers there combined. It's a very large carrier force. There's capital ships out there, quite a lot of them. A lot of destroyers, a lot of submarines, a lot of forces. There might even be allied forces there. Hopefully not the burn. And what are they going to do? Well, you're doing a long-range blockade on Japan, but that's not going to knock Japan out the war. You have to go find a fleet. So you have to go to them. It might be the Japanese come out to come and attack you. They're trying to do a Pearl Harbor on you in Hong Kong and Manila, or something like that. Or you decide you're going to do a Taranto on them in Cure, etc. And I'll talk about that in a second. And you go out. And you will meet somewhere in East China Sea. Again, there's going to be various points of intelligence which are going to tell them. Again, the signals intelligence is probably going to be just as key as actually... Um, deciphered intelligence. So signal intelligence by that means is where are the communications going on? What's the volume of communications? What kind of quantity of communications are going on? Is going a signals and traffic analysis going to be critical in terms of intelligence or intelligence work of working out where the Japanese are and what they're doing. Deciphering their messages is one thing. That's great. If you can do that, that's brilliant. You're reading their you're reading their recipe book. But if you can't do that, the next best thing is to what, be able to get the messages about what they're doing, what they're shouting across the kitchen as the chefs are cooking, chefs are cooking up the dish. So, as you're doing that, you can then arrange things. And again, it becomes a scenario. Who, where do they catch them? If the intelligence works well, again, I think it works much rather as the Hong Kong style battle. If it works well, the Allies. The British take it, use a night, do and carry out night strikes and night operations. I don't see the Americans having managed to work up to a fully night capable force at this point, but they probably do have squadrons available are capable of night operations by this point. Um, the British will still probably have their fully night capable force at this point. They managed to maintain it for 
the whole of World War Two, so therefore they probably do, still at this point. So they would be doing a night strike, as much damage as they can, and then in daytime, an alpha strike of every aircraft they have available at dawn would go off to finish off everything, and then capital ships come in. Again, if the Japanese manage to catch them in harbours, expect a sort of Pearl Harbour style attack, but also expect them to be fundamentally trying to do something smart. Again, by this point, there might have been a changeover in command of the Japanese Navy at sea. Whether it's Yamamoto in charge, it's Soroku Yamamoto, or whether it is someone else in charge, it's probably going to depend upon the internal politics back in Japan. If they are perceived to be losing it, the army might have got more militants. Remember, of course, if Soroku Yamamoto is actually moved to the combined fleet by Yonai because he thinks that the army is going to kill Yamamoto and he, does, and he needs to protect him because he's the best he's got at that position to go and command the combined fleet. It's an issue. And... Hang on. Excuse me a second. That's the right place. So, there is the other scenario. Japan goes completely against the grain, decides to copy the German plan from World War One, thinking, right then, we found ourselves at war against both the British and the Americans. They've got no distractions. They're able to entirely concentrate on the Pacific War. There's no other war going on elsewhere. We're going to adopt the fleet in being strategy, and we're going to keep our fleet safe. They would probably be ha uh, keeping their battle fleet, etc., back in Kyura or Hash Hashirajima. Um... And I'm pretty much certain the Royal Navy would go for a Taranto on them. Now, this again is a very interesting scenario. Again, it's a night strike capability. And it's... Again, it depends on... you. For night air defense, you require a lot of things. But the Japanese are going to be doing their level best. And they're going to be having... Uh, uh, putting the level best to put in searchlights, put in guns, etc. to provide air defense. But again, the British do have that advantage for harbours, which no one else does and no one else really understands. And if I can find my torpedo, where is my fluffy torpedo? I will explain it. I have lost my fluffy torpedo, which sounds wrong. I know, losing. There it is. There's my fluffy torpedo. So, the British advantage and in naval aviation comes down to the... Swordfish can look a very dumb aircraft in its period, but it has several very, very advanced party tricks. And this is one scenario which is why you keep it around. Because it's very stable, very easy to fly, which makes it excellent for night attacks, and easy to maintain, which makes it excellent for being operating the other side of the world, but it's also got one other thing. Because of its stability, because of its ability to fly in a very safe way, with very simple, uh, with very easy controls, you can s mount your torpedo, your aerial torpedo, differently than other people do. And other people don't develop this. So there are lots of torpedoes end up with wooden extender fins on their rear to help them do less of a this, which tends to break the torpedo or hit, make them hit the mud on the seabed, especially if they're ducking the harbour, to try and make them do this. Which is what the Japanese do to try and get effect at Pearl Harbor. Now, the British go one step further. They add a tension wire which unravels on the from the belly of the aircraft to the torpedo. And this means the torpedo actually belly flops, which is one of the reasons why Royal Navy torpedoes are quite so effective in, in, in Taranto, contrast to Pearl Harbor. And of course, after the battle, there are all these extra, these wires and war, but who knows, there's tons of wires come off ships in combat. There's been all sorts of firing going on. Who's going to take notice of extra wires in the water? No one does. But this means the torpedoes belly flop, which means they don't hit the bottom, they don't crack, and they tend to run straight into their target. That is the British secret to night attack operations in har of, of enemy fleets in harbour. And if they do that, then, well, in the nicest way, I don't see many of Japan's ships surviving. I do see Japan potentially coming out and going, we will attack. You know, in, in the nicest way, I do see them going, full of, oh, if there's no safety in harbour, we should go and get honour for the Emperor and charging out. 
I do see them doing perhaps doing that, and then there being a big battle. So I do see it being kind of as Taranto was wanted, because, as I said in the Taranto videos, for Cunningham, Taranto was actually the worst of two worlds. It was not effective enough to actually annihilate the Italian fleet. It just knocked them out, uh, knocked them out of a lot of large number of ships out of action for a while, and they still managed to put two capital ships at sea out of a while. Now, as I said before, you cannot. There's no way you can get the Gilio Cesare, no matter what you do. So the Italians were all going to end up with one capital ship surviving. But um, on the other scenario, they actually do too much because they actually damage the Italians so much the Italians don't come out. He has his, all his capital ships sitting there as part of that operation. They're all that he has the largest capital ship strength he has had at the war so far. He outnumbers the Italians practically in capable ships. If the Italians had gone charging out to come and attack the carrier and to try and get their revenge on the Royal Navy for actually, because again, there's multiple operations. There's even some Royal Navy ships going into the Adriatic into the very definition of Mare Nostrum at this point, to try and encourage the Italians to come out. If they come out, they could have fought, they would have... His plan was to hopefully fight a night battle against the Italians, and... or even an... or maybe an early morning battle, and win. Capital ship to capital ship engage and knock out the Italian fleet. Of course, they don't come out because, A, there's enough of them damage they can't risk coming out because they know there's no chance, of them actually being able to survive, uh, to win any battle. But they're not, they're not damaged enough, they're permanently knocked out of the war. So it's, it, it's a great victory, but it's for Cunningham, it's a... Oh, for goodness sake. Just a couple more. If he'd had the second carriers, originally, if Eagle had been there as well as Illustrious, or it had been Glorious had survived, and he'd been a Glorious and Illustrious, or something like that, and you'd had more aircraft be involved in the strike... The likelihood is would it would have been closer to the taking the Italian fleet out of the war. They could well have been down to one or two or one or even two capital ships for the remainder of the war, considering how long it does take them to repair certain ships. Now, with the Japanese, they are more likely to come out, and so you end up with another big battle. And the ultimate point of all this is that the Japanese are a very capable enemy. They are a very capable force. But in 1939, in this period, they are not anywhere near what they would become, but they're also not organised to achieve what they did. And if you're going from a standing start, then usually the force of the, na the na nation which has the more infrastructure, industry, and the larger force to call upon can generate the force more quickly to deploy it and manoeuvre it. And especially when you've got two very conservative strategic battle plans, i.e. the Britons is in circle and slowly move in over months, years, as they built up forces, whereas the Japanese plan is to wait for the British to come in, you are very unlikely to get uh, fighting early on, which allows actually works in the British favour, because it allows their industry to mo fully mobilise, get more orientated, especially while they're fighting a war while not under the pressures of the war in the UK that you see in World War II, what you get is a very different scenario. But still, an interesting one to discuss. Bill Trump's memes, always popular, always do enjoy them, so please keep them coming in. And we have more videos coming up, and we have more lives, and you should have had yesterday now, although today when I'm recording it, the uh, ship design coming up, and of course next week we have the close blockade, which is the very opposite from this scenario, because this is this whole plan of the British is by definition a distant blockade. It's basically doing to Germany what the British have done to the uh, doing to Japan what the British did to Germany in World War One. And there were some comments and live. It's the British doing the same, but the same war plan they always do. Yes, but it works. That's the point. It works. And Britain knows from World War One just how damaging to an island nation such a scenario can be. And again, as part of this blockade, you would have submarines ranging out of Singapore, going up to the South East China Sea, etc. As Britain gets to Clo gets to Hong Kong, and especially if the the Americans are involved in South Manila, and you've got submarines operating from there, you can imagine what they will be doing to Japanese trade, as long with you know, and Japanese coastal forces and Japanese trade with Korea. 
this would all be part of this operation. So, I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you found it interesting. And, um, well, thank you for watching. Take care. The question that I'm going to ask for the comments is this question, really. And so it's a simple one. And it's a long-term one. So, under this scenario, and under the most likely scenario in my thinking, I'm not sure if Germany gets involved. I don't think Germany is likely to declare war while they're fighting. I think Italy probably lines up on the side of the Allies for their honour, uh, for the glory, etc., uh, to fight the Japanese and sends out some capital ships. And I'm fairly certain the Americans are part of the alliance from the get-go because I said the real politic and the, their view on a Pacific war. How would the world change? There is quite a possibility that the Soviet Union gets involved as well to go after their islands and um, they have incentives for doing that. So, you know, I'd like to hear what you think the world would be like after this war and what you think would change. What do you think would be effect on aircraft carriers? What do you think would be effect on capital ships? In this scenario, there is capital ships and carriers operating in tandem. They operate as part of a well, a well put together battle plan. You can say there is a passing of the baton because the carrier has the, all these capabilities, but there's also going to be a clear justification still for capital ships. So the lions probably get built. And I have said before, I think this war would probably last till about 1941-42. I think it would. Mainly because the pace the British uh, British and Americans would go at, and because if you're not planning on invading Japan, even once you defeated their fleet, you're probably blockading them and going around bombarding their coast, destroying their, tr destroying their fishing fleets, all those sort of things. The odds are it takes a while for Japan to actually realise they are not going to get anywhere. It gets quicker if Yonai, or etc., is put in charge, because they are the more sensible ones who will realise what they're up against and will just go, Emperor, we have to sue for peace. And I don't think anyone really wants to invade the Japanese home islands. So, 1941 seems about sensible to me. So, what do you think the world is like? What do you think happens to the world? How do you think it changes? Do you think Stalin gets his battle cruisers? Do you think Mussolini, after seeing what the aircraft carriers do, starts to buy aircraft carriers? Does he still go with the system based on the Graf Zeppelin, which is, of course, based on the burn, or does he go with a ally American British, you know, inspired design, or a Japanese inspired design? What happens to the Germans? As said, I have the general... I think, in the nicest way, in this period, under that scenario, they don't. They take the time to build up their resources, and I do realise their economy is running hot, but they can probably keep it going till 1942, especially if they join the war, definitely. But this is going to change the scenario for them because the pace of development and rather the pace of implementation of new technologies in the American and Fr in the British, the American, the French forces are going to be quite great. You might well see jet fighters fielded by the British. Especially with the fleet, with the Royal Air Force wanting to get in the fight, wanting long-range bomber aircraft, long-range strike aircraft that can strike Japan, so they can actually be part of the war. Because a big part of the problem for them, and the reason why this is such a naval war, is the ranges. The the British bomber aircraft are designed around European ranges, not Far Eastern ranges, and in terms of scope of operation. So it's going to cause a massive development in all of the British industry and British structure. It's also going to have an effect on the army because, again, what sort of war are they going to... what sort of battles are they going to be involved in? The retaking of Hong Kong? Okay. Capturing of Wei Hai Wei, supporting the Chinese army, perhaps, against the Japanese, that sort of scenario. They're not going to be really 
at the forefront of the fighting. But they're going to be given a lot of opportunities to develop their technology and assess things and understand them and develop things. So it's going to be an accelerated and far more enhanced version in that regards of the Spanish Civil War and its effect on militaries. It's interesting. And, well, I'm now approaching nearly an hour and 55 minutes. So I'm going to say thank you very much for watching. I look forward to your comments and I hope you enjoyed and I hope you found it interesting. And if there's anything I haven't covered in sufficient detail, it's because it's nearly two hours long and there's only so much you can fit in that time and you can really make this into about a dozen videos and a whole book. And I'm talking about a book with about 200,000 words in it. Thank you very much for watching. Take care and see you tomorrow because Sunday is when hopefully, if the parts have all arrived, I'll be finishing off Age of Spellfast. Take care.